Hello everybody, welcome back. The introduction has already been made, so let's be, I'm gonna be brief. So I've written a piece based on the material that we have been using throughout the past episodes. I've hired a real orchestra to record it. In part one of the video, we covered the first half of the piece. So let's take it from where we left it. I wanted this whole section to sound sweet, hence the Italian word dolce, which basically means sweet. And this whole section, I think, is a little bit reminiscent of what is happening at the beginning of the piece, with, with the melody being passed between different instruments, starting with violas, then moving to violin one, and then the solo trumpet. And of course, we have the solo French horn taking the melody in a four, you know, just gluing these two different parts together. But as you just heard from the recording, it's not very noticeable. It's supposed, it's supposed to be background kind of stuff. And what's happening underneath these parts is basically the rest of the strings and the woodwinds playing the chords. And later on 82, I'm swapping the woodwinds with the French horns. Big kind of build up on 84 and 85 into the big version of the melody at 86. For this, we have violins and violas in octaves and trumpets as well. As you saw me doing now many, many times, the second time we repeat the theme, it gets doubled by the rest of the woodwinds just to make it a little bit stronger. What's happening underneath it is again, just chords on, you know, low strings and low brass. And these two bars are transitioning material from this horn section, you know, into the following one. And the way we do this is by just holding that high G on strings and woodwinds and using the rest of the brass section and the woodwind section to create a cadence leading into the following section. Let's start by having a look at the strings. That was the strings, let's now play the brass. Beautiful vibrato on the solo trumpet. And now let's have a listen to the woodwinds. I think this part of the piece showcases some of the things that you cannot really do virtually. I'm talking about this doubling, you know, cellos and violas and bassoons, you know, taking the melody. As you heard from the recording, these sounds blend together in a very peculiar kind of way that is very difficult to recreate, you know, virtually. And I'm not so sure to why that happens, but but I think it has something to do with, you know, the resonance of these instruments and what is happening inside 
of the room. So yeah, as we said, violas and cellos and bassoons take in the melody, while trombones, tuba and basses and timpani as well are doing some stabs, you know, in the background, playing the chords. Violins are playing some shorts, just, you know, to, to keep the piece flowing. We have a couple of nice answer phrases here on the French horns and, uh, and the flute, uh, doubled by glockenspiel. The second half of this section is basically the same kind of orchestration. The only difference is that I swapped, you know, this violin part, you know, the spiccatos with, with the rest of the woodwinds and the violins just doing some chords kind of thing and playing some harmonies later from 106 and, and forward. Something that really shows when you're looking at a score is some of the patterns that a composer likes to use. And it's particularly clear in this piece that, you know, one of the things that I do very often is finishing all the phrases with the melody being played in octaves by basically the whole orchestra. We've seen this over and over throughout the piece. Here, bar 90, bar 71, bar 49, and so on. And this is something that I've done for this section as well. As you can see, we have the rest of the woodwinds and the strings, you know, with the violins playing, you know, the top line of the melody leading into the following section of the piece. Okay, so here's how the strings sound like. And now let's do brass and timpani. And finally, the woodwinds. By the way, this octave that you, that you see over here, I, I remember just I remember that I originally had this doubling on on the oboe on in the mock-up, but I decided to remove it last minute because I didn't really like it. Right, so let's have a listen to everything together again. <laughs> a lot of stuff going on for this part the melody is really really big played in octaves by by strings some really brassy kind of moments like this bar 114 overall some kind of stabs and you know chords and accents happening in the background while on the top we have the woodwinds doing some really intricate stuff i was actually surprised this worked as well as it did you know what 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 we have going on over here is basically some kind of arpeggios dovetailing you know that's just so that the players can breathe with a harp basically providing some glue underneath all this and this is not supposed to to sound tight or anything it's just supposed to provide a little bit of you know shimmery kind of brilliance underneath the most important parts so the melody and the and the rhythm really so this is just basically providing a little bit of excitement to the parts with this kind of arpeggios and here at 118 we have a big kind of run going into a trill and strings are doing a big tremolo while uh, really big we have you know horns and trumpets you know blasting just doing this kind of chords cool so let's start with the woodwinds maybe 
since it's the last thing I talked about. This part sounds a little bit sloppy, but it's not supposed to be tight. And I think I mentioned it before in the video. It's just supposed to be adding a shimmery top end on top of everything else. And and as you can see, what I decided to do, you know, last minute when I when I made the score is to turn these sixteenths into triplets just so it would be easier to play. <laughs> I think I did some boosting on the closed microphones there, that's why it sounded weird. So let's now have a listen to the strings. Uh, we said that they're all basically taking the melody except for the bass. <laughs> really strong. And then the brass. I really like the rip here on the horns. It wasn't in the score. I think it's a tiny mistake, but you know, I really, really like it. Do you hear it? I think I should have played the woodwinds together with the harp before, just to give you some context. Let me play a little bit of that very quickly. <laughs> So as you can hear, it's a little bit better, you know, it blends a little bit better. All right, let's have a listen to everything together again. Positionally, I think this brass part is quite interesting, at least the rhythm, you know, with these dotted quarter notes is, even, is an even kind of rhythm and it gives the illusion of some kind of metric modulation, but we are still in 3-4. And answering this part, we have these big notes on, on low strings and low brass and low woodwinds. And this whole part continues for a bit until, you know, 127 where we have the melody taken again by you know strings and with winds just like we did before remember so let's now start with the brass we they have all the most important parts you know with melody and you know the counter phrases on the bass from bones and tuba so let's play those <laughs> So that was brass, let's play woodwinds and strings. And maybe percussion on its own, why not? The timing obviously is never going to be as tight as in the mock-up where everything is quantized and that was, you know, expected. So don't be surprised if you have things happening a little bit early, a little bit late, you know, it all adds to this, you know, very natural kind of sound. So let's have a listen to everything together again uh, until the end. <laughs> And then the piece terminates with, with, you know, some fanfarish moments. We have French horns and trumpets playing basically two octaves apart and trombones filling in with the rest of the core tones. Basses, cellos, bass trombone, tuba and bassoons doing yet again some 
answer phrases, while widths and strings are basically just finishing the phrase that came from the previous two bars and holding, you know, the top note of the phrase, eventually going back into some measured trims building to the following section. At 1.33 we are ending big, we have some marching band kind of pattern, you know, in 3-4, within the string section and low brass, some big swells on horns and trumpets which have been dominating pretty much, you know, the, the yeah, the, the ending part of the piece, while we have some big kind of runs on, on, on woodwinds. So this particular orchestrational device, it is something we've talked about countless times. I would almost always try to use runs for articulation. For example, what we have happening at 133 with the horns and the trumpets is we have this kind of, you know, crescendos, right? So by placing a run over here, you basically end up making that crescendo feel a little bit bigger without necessarily having to mark, you know, the horns and the trumpets up. So that's to me a very efficient way to use orchestration to achieve articulation, right? Uh, so the very same thing happens at 135. And percussion is really going together with this. You know, we have some harp glissandos following exactly the same kind of shape that we have on the woodwinds but also some swelling on, you know, the cymbals and timpani as well, while the snare is just basically, you know, doubling the violins, the viol you know, the string parts and the low brass. Now, here's what we have on brass for those, you know, fanfarish kind of moments. Let's have a listen to the strings. And these are the woodwinds. I mean, you can't see the runs in the mock-up because, you know, I've used some pre-recorded runs and so, yeah, there's no MIDI for it. And finally, let's have a listen to percussion. <laughs> Very good, I'm just gonna let it play until the end now. Last section, con amore. What what this means is basically with love, you know. And uh, I really like I really really like this section, you know. I wanted to give it a more retro kind of sound, so so I've marked it con sordino. And you know, everything about this is kind of retro. I've asked the players to 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 play with more vi vibrato, you know. And, and yeah, so we have these big, dense kind of chords in the strings and the woodwinds as well, with the first flute doubling the violin line and the rest of the woodwinds essentially just filling in the chords with, with extensions and stuff like that. And the harp is basically just reinforcing the harmony. And the very last kind of detail, mark tree is low. You know, I very often use this when I want to to give it a more magical kind of vibe. And that works particularly well together with the harp glissando. And that's precisely what I'm doing over here. Just, you know. So that's pretty much it. So this last part is basically just strings and woodwinds. 
And let's just start by playing the strings. Oh, and something I did different over there, rather than doing like a run, uh, I, I've done, I've done like a portamento kind of thing. I just didn't have a library that has a long portamento like that for two beats. So I've replaced it with the run over there. Man, these more intimate kind of moments are so good compared to the mock-up. The difference is shocking. I mean, you haven't heard it, but I can tell you. So let's just play the woodwinds now, and then we're going to have a listen to the full piece. All right, guys, that's all. So let's have a listen to the piece from the beginning.
All right, guys, that would be everything. So thank you so much for making this possible. As I said at the beginning of the video, if you like what I do, do feel very free to head over to my Patreon and check out, you know, what I've been sharing so far. There is truly a ton of stuff in there and people, you know, seem to enjoy it. If you enjoyed the video, please hit the like button, subscribe if you're new. Thank you very much for watching and see you on the next one. Bye.